You're watching The 7 from WATE 6 on your side. Good evening, I'm Bo Williams, and welcome to The 7. Glad you're with us. Let's get a look at the Big 7 stories happening right now. Topping our list tonight, early voting for the 2022 federal and state general election is underway. Candidates right now doing everything they can to, of course, grab voters, including running attack ads on their opponents. Now, several negative ads have been circulating around Knoxville from the political opponents of Tennessee House Representative Gloria Johnson and House Seat District 18 candidate Gregory Kaplan. And as Knox County Republican Party Chair Daniel Herrera tells us, data shows that voters well, they are paying attention. Candidates are always going to talk about their, their, their positives. They're going to talk about their best features. Uh, and there might be some things they don't want to highlight, and that's where negative ads come in. Herrera adds, though, that there has to be a balance. Still, candidates with the Democratic Party just want the negative ads to stop. Be about the, pro uh, the, the process of making Knox County better. And that's, that, 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 to me, will we'll lift all boats and, and things will get a lot better once we stop this nasty, harmful rhetoric. So again, I'm asking them to cut these commercials out immediately, cut these flyers out, let's run on the issue, and the best candidate will win the race. And we did reach out to David Posey, who is the Republican candidate running for state representative for District 90. Uh, we have not heard back at this time. Election Day, by the way, is Tuesday, November 8th. Next on our list today is the last day to request an absentee ballot for the upcoming midterm election. So if you're out of town or if you are eligible for an absentee ballot because of COVID or other reasons, make sure to sign up before it's too late. Uh, the easiest way to do that before the deadline is to go online, fill out the form, and then email it to your local county election commission office today. In Knox County, that email is absenteeballot at knoxcounty.org. If you're voting in person, early voting runs through this Thursday, November 3rd, with Election Day on November 8th. Now, we have a sample ballot over on our website. Just go to WATE.com. Continuing our Big 7 coverage of a breaking story that we brought you just hours ago. One person is dead. Two people have now been taken into custody after a chase and standoff at a high school dollar general. WAT6 on your side reporter Paige Weeks has been on the scene for us, and she joins us now with more. The sheriff's office says this car chase turned standoff is over with one person committing suicide. I'm going to step out of the way to let you see what we've been looking at all afternoon. Authorities say all of this started around 2:30 when an officer tried to pull over a car going 80 miles per hour on the Clinton Highway. That car led officers to the 19 fuel stop here in Raccoon Valley. Once there, authorities say the suspect ran from the car, leaving two other people inside, and eventually fired at a responding officer. That officer then fired back, but we don't know if the suspect was hit. We do know the suspect eventually made it inside the store where multiple people were working and had to barricade themselves. They were able to at least help our officers know where he was at, what was going on. Uh, some of them were in the parking lot when it happened. We had a couple of people that also witnessed the shooting as well. And that's where we're getting our information of it being more of a self-inflicted gunshot wound. We'll continue bringing you coverage both on the air and on WATE.com as more information is released. Reporting in Knox County, Paige Weeks, WATE, 6 on your side. All right, Paige, thank you. Next on the Big 7 at 7, a student is accused of bringing a fake gun to school, reportedly causing some alarm. McMinn County Sheriff Joe Guy says this happened at McMinn County High School. Sheriff Guy says the student, an unnamed 16-year-old, got out the fake gun in the cafeteria and showing it to other students. Well, here's a picture of what uh, was shared by the sheriff. You can see the gun, uh, sheriff, or the fake gun, I should say. Sheriff Guy says the fake gun was a piece of solid metal that was made to look like a handgun. We're told school resource officers then took the teen into custody. The sheriff says charges against the 16-year-old will be filed through juvenile court as the investigation continues. He adds that any threats to schools will always be taken seriously. Meanwhile, the school is in the process of disciplining the student. Next on our list for you, the Justice Department has filed new documents in court seeking the forfeiture of a sedan, a pickup, and a gun Authorities believe were used in a series of attacks in East Tennessee. Last night, we told you that Mark Reno, who passed away last year, has now been named in a handful of separate investigations, including the fire that destroyed the Knoxville Planned Parenthood, the shooting out of windows at the Duncan Federal Building in downtown Knoxville, and finally being involved in the January 6th riot. We're told Reno had been under surveillance, and he allegedly admitted to undercover agents that he was part of a group known as Church Militant Resistance. 
Now, the Department of Justice says Reno was arrested in mid-July. The department adds he was released from custody one month later for health reasons, and we're told he died one day after his release, reportedly suffering from some sort of medical condition while he was awaiting trial in Kentucky. Next on the 7 for UT football player Jayla McCullough will get his next day in court earlier than expected. A preliminary hearing set for November 18th has now been moved up to the 10th. McCullough was arrested last month, accused of assault and a confrontation with a man who entered his apartment. McCullough's attorney wants the charge dropped, arguing he acted in self-defense and offering up a different account than the one recorded in the arrest report. Rounding out the Big 7, I am celebrated the reopening of the River Trail today after a long three years of rebuilding. Now, the River Trail was once a, a one-mile loop until a storm back in 2019 washed away a large section of trail. The boardwalk remained open but could be accessed only from the opposite side. Now, all those hurdles are gone. Staff and volunteers worked hard to remove invasive species. Plus, the Appalachian Mountain Bike Club created a new section of trail, installing a support rail and building up the existing path. IAM's executive director, Amber Parker, described what they've been through. This project involved so many different people. During the time when this trail was closed, all the natural resource staff here, as well as a ton of volunteers, we call them our adopt-a-spotters, removed a ton of invasive plants. So when we walk on this trail, you're going to have better views of the river, and the wildflowers are also starting to come back as now that those, um, those competing plants have been removed. River Trail and Boardwalk officially reopened at 11 o'clock this morning, and if you want to check it out, the River Trail is only accessible by foot, and the route includes some significant inclines.